One of the things about State of the Art that from the artist perspective is that it's the kind of studio you wish as an artist, um, but rarely get. So that standard narrative is that if you want to be discovered as an artist, you have to leave and go to LA or New York. Um, but this kind of homogenized consolidation feels a lot like the too big to fail mantra, which is to say, that everything will start to look the same if everyone lives in the same place and you kind of lose that regional specificity. So Savannah artists, stay in Savannah and stay proud. <laughs> yeah. um, plus, this is my first time in Savannah and like, um, I, I love this city, this place is great. Um, and so for us, um, not having to be in one of these cities was actually a really refreshing thing. And here, Crystal Bridges basically offered an antidote, an antidote, a willingness to go beyond what's delivered at those doorsteps in LA and New York and go with a certain kind of genuine idealism and curiosity. Um, so in 2013, I had recently returned from North Dakota, which if you noticed was not one of the states that Chad visited. <laughs> so, um, he got a twofer with me, I think. Um, um, and this was my hometown from eight years to 18, and I had been away for about 20 years. This homecoming actually felt Odysseus-like, some underpinning of a kind of familiarity, but bundled in sites that didn't actually always match one's memory, not because the place had changed, because it hadn't that much, um, but because the person had. And it's kind of like when you go home, if you have the for good fortune of uh, uh, going back to a childhood home and you're like, nothing is the right proportions. Um, nevertheless, if your window of adolescence is in a Norwegian Lutheran town in the 1980s and you are a Korean American, one of a few that you can count on your hand, there is a profound and lasting impact on your identity. <laughs> This is day two. I presented this slide last night and it's still traumatic to see this. <laughs> um, so, so that girl is still in me um, and that, that impact of, of, of living in a place during that time in your life, um, it still resonates with me today. Um, but right now, when I went back, fracking had been in the news. And if you remember, in about 2013, North Dakota was in the spotlight because unlike every other state that was really suffering from the 2008 recession, North Dakota was experiencing a boom because of fracking. Um, and suddenly, your home state, your quiet home state with like few thousands of people is national news and this is really bizarre. Um, fracking, as you know, unlocked enormous amounts of oil. We're we're talking millions and millions of barrels. Um, North Dakota was uncomfortable for being in the spotlight because it had been recession proof, but there was also a vilification of this process. Um, but the conversation was about reliance on not only um, the environmental damage potentially, but also Middle East independence from oil. So sending you know, our troops over to basically protect oil interests was something that maybe we could actually um, unlock our claws from. So these small towns that I remember from like speech and debate tournaments, suddenly were overrun 24 seven with oil trucks and tankers nonstop. So as an artist, I was like totally curious about this and I was curious about the towns that I had left 20 years ago and about the oil industry, which really wasn't that much of a presence in North Dakota when I grew up. I was curious especially about the people who had lost everything in the recession and left to start their lives over again. So I left in February in 2013 with my camera to see what was going on, to see what an oil boom and a frenzy of industry does to a place. So this was just one of the first things that we saw, which was this form ha farmhouse that said gas through the roof. Um, the interesting thing about waving an artist card as opposed to a journalist card is the access that you get. So at the time, 
No one wanted to talk to journalists because journalists had a very particular agenda and a story they wanted to present. And as you know, especially if you're someone of color, oftentimes you don't get to control your narrative. And I think in a lot of ways, North Dakota felt like that. Um, so when you wave an artist card, people were like, I'm not quite sure what you are, so why do you want to talk to me? And that's actually usually a much more interesting point of entry. Um, so we got access to oil rigs that were shut down from any other outside source because they were frankly really dangerous and they were literally working people 24-7. It was a non-stop endeavor and a machine, like a labor machine. Um, we also saw what people like were living in because there weren't enough places to live at the time. I mean, these towns were like 3,000 and overnight they were doubling, tripling, and it was all men. So um, when you're living in 20 below weather um, and you bring your trailer, you will discover every single tiny little crack um, that lets in cold air and you will seal that like nobody's business. Um, <laughs> I think there's a kind of like wonderful ingenuity that we saw, this like real survivor instinct that was kind of admirable and, um, and it was just this like general hustle mentality that I think as artists we all kind of understand at some level and this was like the serious manifestation of it that kind of actually put me to shame. Um, so I'll, this is one of the works that I had um, developed which is a two channel video. Um, one of the presidents of an oil company invited us to jump on his private plane and actually fly over the Bakken Reserve. And so there's something kind of majestic about this. And then what you'll see are these like oil rigs like punctuating the landscape. So it's got that like horrifyingly beautiful and kind of like horrifying um, state with the, you know, understanding what it does to the environment. Um, let me see if I can go forward a little bit. Um, there was also something about the North Dakota landscape, which if you've ever been there, is kind of hostile and indifferent um, to humanity at some level. The sense of geologic time is much more prevalent than the kind of time that we you know, have on our, our phones and our watches. Um, but this actually kind of amplified what was happening in the industry because these pumps would kind of go on and on and on forever and they would have this kind of interesting creek that no matter when you went, whether it was 2 a.m. or 8 a.m., um, it was constantly going. Um, and there was also, because of all the roads that were overrun by, the, by all of these oil rigs, you would have detritus like dead animals that were just kind of tossed to the side and this indifference just kind of like seemed amplified in this, um, in this environment. Um, as well, uh, let's see if I can find this. Um, we stayed in these thing called, um, these um, places called man camps and that's exactly what they were. Um, men living in camps. Um, there was no such thing as a weekend or evenings or a day off. They oftentimes wanted to work um, overtime because that's how they actually got paid, you know, a livable wage. Um, and then if they didn't qualify to live in one of the man camps, they brought their trailers and they lived um, in these kind of uh, makeshift trailers. But each one of them sort of are really kind of cool because they're distinctive and individual in a way. And they also sort of like have this like keeping up with the Joneses thing, which is like if somebody had a mudroom, then they needed to have a mudroom. And, um, and then like some of them had like benches on the outside to sort of be like, if you're a neighbor, you can come and sit down. <laughs> um, which was really kind of cool. Um, and then the other part that really struck me was, you know, seeing the nonstop trains that were delivering oil out of this and like getting shipped to places like Texas. Um, they were drilling so fast at this time that you, they couldn't actually capture the natural gas that was, um, that was on the top of the oil. And so you'd have these flares that were going up like 50 feet in the air and they were punctuating the landscape and, and burning 24 seven. It was so hot that you could be probably about half a mile away from one of these and feel the heat. And this was 24 seven. Um, if you actually go back to North Dakota right now, however, if you notice gas is at a kind of a all time low um, and so most of these towns have now shut down. So that real idea of a boom and bust was amplified in a place like North Dakota. Um, and that kind of shock to the system is something that, you know, everyday people don't really um, survive very well. Um, so 
part of um, what I wanted to do, not only was this channel video, or these, this two-channel video, was to create a series of video portraits. And three of these are what you're going to see in the exhibition today. So I wanted to understand what the lives were like of the individuals there, but not as a documentary, and again, not as a journalist, but to just be with them and kind of understand the energy and the, and, and like what Chad says about like having a sense of empathy for who they were. So we would create video portraits, and all I asked them to do was just to sit for a moment. And for a lot of them, this was a huge challenge because they did not like to sit still. So we would start the camera, and then we would just roll until they literally just got up and left. <laughs> <laughs> and then that was it. And then they're like, I gotta go. I got, like, this is, like, time is money at this point in time. Um, one of the things that I hope that you see in the video portraits is not um, a photograph, right? It's like what happens a moment after that photograph is taken and what happens a moment after that. And they're also not like Harry, uh, Harry Potter kind of video that talks or like when you're in Disney and you have those like talking paintings. To me, those are like um, their energy outwards, right? They're there to entertain you. And for me, the idea was to try and draw the audience into their space and for you to basically sit with them, which you rarely, rarely get to do, right? If you started to stare at somebody for even more than a minute, that person would be like, why are you staring at me? Um, so here's a chance to be able to just be with a person and just sit with them. Um, it was incredibly muddy. It was insanely muddy there. I've never seen so much mud in my entire life. And it was so cold, and yet they constantly were like nonstop working. Um, another um, set of work that I did was a, um, a series of core samples. So before you did any kind of drilling, you dug to see what the kind of, um, what the layers of the, of the earth was like. And I used this metaphor to create core samples of a lot of the individuals there, but it was a core sample of somebody's life. So it was like at the beginning or the bottom was like the beginning of their life and I would embed objects from their stories um, to like where they, um, you know, kind of where they were today. So all of you kind of have like, if you dig down, like a sense of a core sample in you. Um, the video portraits also, um, these are two of the ones that you'll see tonight. Um, that thing on the side there is not uh, the moon, although that's what it looks like. It's actually one of those flares, one of those natural gas flares that are, fl um, um, that are right behind this um, gentleman's trailer. Um, this gentleman also is in the middle, and um, those forearms are not amplified. They are the size of what did you see here? So they're like the size of my legs. Um, this guy in particular, his name is Johnny, and he's sort of this complicated guy where you'll look at him and you're like, is he challenging me? Is he smirking? I don't really know. Um, but what I hope you can do when you see them is that you'll get a sense of like not only who they are, but you'll be like, wait a second, I kind of know somebody like that. And to me, I'm like, that's sort of that first step is to say, you all know somebody like this, and these are not people that are just out there doing the oil rig work, but somebody that might be your neighbor and might be a friend of yours. So um, when the exhibition went up this time, the first time was in North Dakota, I invited all of the people that I'd spoken to to join and say, hey, you know, this is basically your lunch break. You know, a three hour drive is literally like, you know, one tenth of your day. Come out, check out the exhibit and, and see, you know, see yourself. Like, you know, I, I hope that you can, you can check it out. And none of them could come. And if you think about it, what are the typical museum hours? It's 11 to five, Tuesday through Saturday. This was not accessible to them. So I began to, it basically made me pause because I said, you know, as an artist, who am I making the work for? And who gets to see this work and who gets access to this? And one of the things that I think was really inspiring about Crystal Bridges was that they have this real strong mission of saying art needs to be accessible to not only the elite, the 1%, but to a much wider audience. And to me, that's an incredibly moving endeavor and one I think that a lot of the artists today share. Um, for me, I wanted to be um, a surgeon at first. Um, I became a high school public teacher in New York, and then I moved into art making. Um, I then decided at some point in time that this kind of like exploration of like who are you making art for, and especially working in digital technology, kind of gave me like an existential crisis. Um, 
as well, at this time, I also just happened to be, you know, uh, single and a lot of my friends were kind of complaining about dating apps and like how they were these horrible dehumanizing things and I had just come from this intense you know adventure of trying to humanize um, the oil the, the oil industry um, so as they said about living artists one of the difficulties is that we don't sort of stay in this nice narrative but we keep mutating and we keep changing um, so I decided that after this whole thing, I was like, well, you know what? Digital technology can actually live 24-7 on your phone. It can be not only um, you know, presented in a museum, but technology can actually be like international. And so what I decided to do was um, when I looked at my life, I was like, all right, if you look at going from a medical school person to a teacher to an artist, um, one pattern that emerges is that it's kind of a continuous deviation from the norm into a more chaotic lifestyle. <laughs> um, another one could be a downward spiral from your income potential. <laughs> um, and, but actually, I think what really ties these all together um, is some idea of being in service to humanity. And that that's actually what gives a certain kind of meaning to your life. Um, my mom is here to, with me um, today. Um, and I think that that kind of impulse I really got from her. So I really want to thank her for sort of being an awesome human being um, and really reinforcing that. When I think about a lot of the interesting artists that I know, um, actually, sorry, um, we'll skip this one. A lot of the interesting artists I know and some of the ones that were at Crystal Bridges, um, many of them have a real commitment and a caretaking for the health of their communities and a commitment to this idea of serving humanity. Um, they are looking to make a real impact in people's lives. So one of the artists that spoke was Matthew Moore, who um, had collaborated with Walmart on educating um, people about where their food came from. Um, another artist, as you had seen with Chad, was Vanessa German, whose work was incredibly powerful and moving because it was about protecting her community. Um, and another artist, um, a, an artist pair, um, Shanai and Colin, they had a water bar at Crystal Bridges, um, which was about like finding and understanding where, ch um, where your water came from. And so if you know about the whole thing in Flint, Michigan, like it really fucking matters to know where your water comes from. Um, and I think this is sometimes where people have forgotten that in a hyper-capitalist dialogue, when you have celebrity artists and art markets and things like Miami art fairs, is that most of the artists you know and the cultural caretakers of the museums and institutions around you care very deeply about the health of their communities around them. So. When I began to look at the impulses that I wanted to do of the technology, it is to sort of amplify a kind of humanity. And so um, that box that I had showed you a little bit earlier, um, that was kind of in the wrong order, um, that box was something that you could call and uh, it would light up. And then you'd be like, oh, cool, interactive art, and then you would leave. Um, the next day, you would get a text message. And you wouldn't know who that message was from, but the message would be like, hey, thanks for connecting. And then you would just delete it and you'd be like, okay, whatever. And the day after that, you'd get another message. And the message would say, why are you not paying attention to me? And then after that, it would say, am I not a priority in your life? And you'd be like, oh my God, what is this, what is this box doing? Um, but the idea was I was looking at how people were using technology and saying, you know, we are all sort of like worried about being forgotten that, you know, with the constant wave of social media and this idea that people are kind of replaceable and that we've objectified them, the idea is that, you know, yeah, you might be replaced. So the box was basically like this needy part of you going like, hey, pay attention to me. Um, and it was really fun as an artist to basically create that dialogue because I could really channel like my most desperate self and then be like, oh my God, I get to actually say these. Um, so, uh, so uh, actually, and as a side story, that work was in LA and um, a gentleman called the gallery and said, I need that to piece to um, stop texting me because my girlfriend thinks I'm cheating on me, on her. <laughs> um, that was an interesting conversation because I was like, hey, this is kind of a teachable moment <laughs> because 
what do you do when someone starts to bother you and you don't want to acknowledge them? Well, in our day and age, it's called ghosting. It's also just called ignoring people. So if you ignore the box for a certain amount of time, it will eventually stop and give up. However, on a side note, I said, the problem with he and his girlfriend is not actually the box's problem. That's something else. So they got to deal with that on their own. <laughs> um, so, um, so when I began to look at the art world, I saw this increasing objectification of humans, and I saw this like hy hypercapitalism that was beginning to devour the art world. And in Seattle in particular, we saw that foundations were closing, grants were shrinking, and galleries were also shutting down. So I also felt like at some point in time, I was like being a grateful beggar, that all I was doing was like asking for that extra hundred dollars and then being so thankful when an institution would give it to me. And I thought, nah, man, I don't want to do that anymore. <laughs> um, so for me, there was a nexus. There was this idea that as an artist working in technology, that I shared a lot of different skills with an entrepreneur, that we hustle, that we know how to will something into existence, and that we are very comfortable with the idea of failure and like knowing and, 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 and sort of a certain kind of uncertainty. So from that, I was like, all right, based on my idea of what about accessibility and impact, based on my ideas of like trying to not objectify humans, and my single friend who were like unhappy with these dating apps, I was like, I'm going to create a dating app. <laughs> and it's called Siren. Um, and the idea is that it's calling out to people and it's saying there is a better way to do something. So on Siren, what we have are daily questions. And like Chad said about the idea of a question, of starting a conversation based on a question, the art of a beautiful question is something that all of us understand. And a beautiful question oftentimes elicits a really beautiful answer. So one of our questions was like, how would a five-year-old describe your job? This is how your profile is created on this app. Another question was, for example, um, where does rain sound best? And this gentleman said, on my record player, when purple. Now. That guy, don't you really want to get to know him? Because I saw this and I was like, who is this guy? Oh my god! I have a total crush on him! <laughs> um, and this is how your profile is created. So it's not just about a photo, because God knows, I mean, like, you know, today I actually spent an extra half hour to look like this, but this is not how I look 99.9% .9 of my life. <laughs> I don't want someone to judge me based on that, but I know I'm funny, and I was like, I want an app that actually can connect people on that way. So these meaningful connections that are based on conversation, that are based on something about your personality, I believe as an artist, I have a place in technology. I have a place in the startup world to contribute something meaningful. Meaningful. Um, so as you can see, like with this person, this is what you see as the person's um, personality. It's like there's the question, and that's the person's response. And this guy made me all like soft and gushy based on his last answer, which is the question was, "What should always be loved?" And his response was, "Your local librarians, the defenders of access to information and challenged books." <laughs> Yeah, right? <laughs> These are the people on our app right now. Um, and the thing is, it's working. So, you know, one of the things that's kind of crazy is like, you know, as an artist, you're like, well, what kind of impact do I have? How many people have seen my work and everything? So I know that people are going on dates and they're falling in love and they're having sex. And as an artist, I mean, like, I was like, this is probably the only work that I will make that people are regularly actually having sex on. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and we just got notice, um, someone emailed me recently and said that she got engaged to someone that she met. So this is incredibly moving. And to me as an artist, I'm like, this is amazing. Um, so I'm really honored to be able to have the opportunity to do this. Um, and when I look at all the institutions, like Crystal Bridges and like Telfairs, and I look at the artists that are here today and the ones um, at the state of the art, um, I'm looking at the artists who care about, again, like the health of their communities and the impact that they can make. And as Chad was saying, we live in an extraordinary time an extraordinary time of change. And artists are not just in a box that are ind indifferent to these kind of changes. So whether it's the Supreme Court's decision on gay marriage or, or Black Lives Matter 
or the fact that we have an agnostic socialist Jew and a woman who are running for president, these are not things that we don't care about. So as artists and as makers and as people who care about artists, bring us into these dialogues because like Siren and these apps and, the, and being in the startup world, we absolutely are committed to making an impact, not only in the art world, but oftentimes in the world outside of us. So please invite us into these conversations and let us um, sort of change the way you think about not only art, but about the world around you. Um, thank you very much. <laughs>